All right, let's begin with the derivative, right? So help me out. What's the rule that we've used up top? Quotient rule, thank you. It's important to know what these things are called, not just so that you know which bit, but so that you're actually calling to mind all the bits of knowledge that are related to this, right? So we've got a nice, easy quotient. Uh, in writing up the working here, uh, we didn't get any labeling, and that's not necessary, but given the number of students I have seen over the years, the hundreds of students who mix up U and V, Still worth actually doing, but I'm happy with this, okay? So what have we got up top? You can see the way that this has been written. This looks to me like U dash V and V dash U. Are you all happy with how that's been written? Yep. And of course, V squared here on the bottom. Now, I deliberately crafted this question so you get a bit of simplifying going on up here. Then there's a common factor, and we're pretty much ready here, okay? Are you satisfied with this answer? Raise your hand if you think you get full marks. And that's interesting, isn't it? Almost all of you were like nodding happily, right? But then, would you think it would get full marks? Turn to the person next to you, and I want you, I'm going to give you 60 seconds, right? If you think it gets full marks, then put your hand up in 60 seconds. If not, tell me why. <laughs> No, you're going to get full marks, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try this again. So, eyes up. I'm going to repeat the question, right? Hands up if you think this should get full marks. Hands up. Okay, this is, keep your hands up. A bit taller, I, I really want to see. Okay, are there any hands that are still down? Tanuki's still working on the question. That's okay, all right, hands down. So, I agree, I think this will be fine, right? Now, just, just to pause, right, and admittedly, uh, this, is, this is on me, this is slightly a trick question, okay? Full marks, like getting given full marks, does not necessarily mean a perfect solution. That makes sense? Full marks just means that I've seen everything from you. You've demonstrated everything that I wanted to assess in this question, right? And for me, what, well, what do you think I'm looking for? I already, I already asked one of them on the first line. I'm looking for you to recognize the quotient rule. Okay, but that's not all, right? If all you did was write down this, which is the quotient rule, I'm not done. So what, what's the difference between this and like the next few lines? This, this simplifying, right? Uh, a bit of algebraic manipulation here. It's all on the numerator, isn't it, right? So worth pointing out that from this line on, there's no calculus involved, right? It's just algebra, okay? Now, this line right here, where we've chosen to stop, I'm pretty happy with it, so should you be. But whether this is the best line in the ideal place where I would leave this answer, or whether, for example, I might write it like so. <clears throat> Why might I do this? This is not a rhetorical question. Why might I actually decide in the context of a question to do this last line, which I've said we don't need. Full marks, it's totally fine. Why might I do it anyway? Yeah. Uh, a future question might ask you to make sketch and find out something. A future question might ask us to sketch and actually do anything, right? The key part is future question. Um, there's a word we use a lot, actually you even used it about a minute ago, which is like really important and helpful, but also super dicey because what this means depends on what happens next. Now, I just gave you question one, end of story. That's why rightly you said thumbs up, full marks. There's nothing more to know, right? But if I ask you to find the next derivative, or if I find, ask you to graph this derivative, that's two really different things, right? Does this make sense? So what simple looks like depends on where you're going. Okay, I've made enough a point on that. Let's have a look at the next question over here. All right. Now, we're a nice, easy answer. Again, it's a warm-up. I feel bad for you because, you know, 7.30, wake up and all that kind of thing. And I was cold getting out of bed this morning, so I assume you were too. What does this mean, this answer down here? Like, you've calculated it, but what's the significance of zero in this context? Hmm. The area under the curve 
The area under the curve. The end area under what curve? Cosine. Okay, great. So it's it's this um, it's this thing right here. We call that the integrand, by the way, right? So I've got cos x like so. By this point in the course, even if I don't ask you to graph it, you should have a version of this playing in the back of your mind as you solve this question. I'll explain why in a second. You're like, why am I spending extra effort to like graph this thing in my head? I'll show you why. Naught to pi. So where are our boundaries? They are here. There's x equals naught, because this is our x-axis. And where's pi? In the middle, right? At least in the middle of where I've drawn the period of this graph. Okay? So you can see the actual area between the curve and the x-axis. You can see they exactly cancel out because of the nice symmetry of all the trigonometric curves, including cosine. So that's why we've got, we have a name for this, by the way. It's actually not just area. It's another word that comes out the front. Have you learned it yet? It starts with an S. It's, say, it, say it louder. Back yourself. <laughs> We're doing this again, you two? Okay, this is called signed area, which, of course, doesn't make sense to you from like 12 months ago because area couldn't be negative, right? Except area can be if you're willing to consider it in this context. All right, excellent. Last one, we really quick, right? So what is this first line of working, which is, which is perfect, what does that indicate about the original question? This question here. Is this thing a quadratic? Hmm. Now, strictly speaking, this question is not a quadratic. But this one is, right? And so we call it's a very awkward name. I think they were trying to come up with a shorter one, but they couldn't. That's why we still call it this. This is an equation reducible to a quadratic if we make the appropriate substitution, right? And then we can just use all the knowledge that we have from here to no, stop. There, right? We're treating it as a quadratic in e to the x. So you're using all of that. Like that's that's three-year-old knowledge by now. Okay? So I'm happy with that. What's going on here? This is a really important line. What's going on there? Hmm. Who wrote this working again? Which one of you was it? Okay, great. Someone help us out. He wrote this line very deliberately, and this is exactly the right working. I'm going to come to the left-hand side of the room. Okay, come on, guys. Someone out of the five of you knows what's going on. Yeah. Exponentials can't be negative. Exponentials can't be negative. So you're on the right track. Uh, let's try and uh, make that a little finer, right? Exponentials <coughs> can be negative if I draw them like that. Yep. Or if I draw them like that. Those are both exponentials, okay? Which is not what you meant, right? This exponential, what does this exponential look like? It's, it is a positive one, just like this one, right? But where is its asymptote? Where is its asymptote? Y equals zero, right? Or, yeah, on the, on the horizontal axis, right? Because I actually didn't label this axis at all. Let's call it Y now. So there is the asymptote that I'm interested in for this one. And there's the rest of the curve, okay? So this particular exponential, e to the x, can never be negative. That's why we discount this one. I probably wouldn't have crossed it out because now I'm like, what was under there? But we get the idea. We're all doing it together. So this is the only solution, x equals log 3. You happy? Excellent.